The following podcast is brought to you by the new AT&T. Hurley digs for answers, Sawyer digs for diamonds, and Nikki and Paolo get into deep. We'll have the dirt on all that and more in today's official Lost podcast hosted by ABC.com. Welcome to the podcast for the episode Left Behind. Executive producer Carlton Cues is here today with two special guests, writers Eddie Kitsis and Adam Horowitz. They, of course, wrote last week's episode and so have some special insight on Expose. Of course, they'll also be taking your fan questions and giving us a preview of next week's episode, Left Behind, which airs Wednesday, April 4th from 10 to 11 p.m. on ABC and is available the next day at abc.com. Before we get to those guys, though, we have a special featurette with Elizabeth Mitchell, who plays... Jack's new infatuation, Juliet. In next week's episode of Lost, entitled Left Behind, it seems that Kate and Juliet find themselves unexpectedly linked together by something more than just Jack. Which is why we thought that before the season goes any further, we should stop and take a look back at just who Juliet is. Or in this case, was. I had always uh, anticipated that she had been less strong and then became more so. I had always anticipated that, yes. She was a completely different person uh, back before. I mean, whatever happened to her on the island, which we we really don't know at this point, obviously it had to have been something huge because, um, although brilliant, which I love, I love the fact that she's a brilliant woman because I I always kind of knew that I suspected, you know, (laughs) like that was the way that it was, and I think everyone else does too. You, You can't help but think that she's incredibly intelligent, but to find out that she's actually brilliant, you know, and that she is... The subservience that she has, the meekness that she has, the lack of spine that she has was is fascinating to me. And where she got that back is kind of is kind of nice. But I feel like she had been someone who kind of had let everyone run all over her and then somehow that's changed and I don't really know when that happened. But that wasn't so much a problem as it was really kind of a joy. Just that whole changeover. It's neat. Did any of her flashback change the way that you treat some of the scenes or some future scenes that came afterwards? Like, oh, my gosh, she had the sister. Um, sure, the sister, the sister part, the fact that, that she's probably really angry. <laughs> you know, like, that, that that was part of it, too. I mean, the fact that her ex-husband, who she still somehow was still, you know, fairly obsessed with, gets hit by a bus in front of her. I mean, that, that colors, definitely colors who you are. And that she also was somewhat complicit in her her going to the island. I mean, she knew she was going there. She only thought it was for a specific amount of time. But that also was really intriguing to me, although I kind of was told that from the beginning. So, I mean, I knew she hadn't been there forever, and I knew she was in her own way trapped there. You want me to help him again? Yes. Are you sure about that, Julia? Yes, I'm sure. And this is... Because he said that he would let you go home. No. No. It's because I'm in trouble. Trouble? I just killed someone. That's why they put me in your room. Oh. It's complicated. That was actually all pretty much a joy to do. The The only thing I had a hard time with was, was when I went to ask for help um, from Jack, which was, for some reason, for, for Juliet, a very hard thing to do. So that was... And he doesn't give it to me. Do you know? So that was that was really, also really hard. To, to not meet your objective when she's such an objective-driven person was really hard. Like, walking away from there and knowing that I was going to be, you know, very possibly killed because I couldn't get him to you know, do what I needed him to do was was really kind of excruciating. But the rest of it was, you know, it's always, it's always fun to work with Matthew just because we, we both like to work so much, you know, and we, we really just work. We, we never talk. We just work. It's so much fun. So. What was so excruciating about it? Did you have to try approaching it different ways for it to work or? We, we, we played a little bit. I mean, it was more, um, kind of an expert game of tennis, really. Um, she can't really tell him what she needs to tell him, but she needs to tell him enough where he'll help her. He's always helped her in the past. She's always been able to, in some way, I wouldn't 
say necessarily manipulate, but I mean on the on a very elegant scale, that's what she she does do. But I think that she was not able to manipulate him. She was not able to um, convince him to help her. And for the first time, her motives were actually really quite straightforward and there, and he just won't. He walks away. Now your character has a scarlet letter, if you will, on her back. My, char- my character has a scarlet letter, which he, he, he then nurtures her. Do you know, I think, I mean, I think that's actually something that when we all read the scene, we, we came and we were like, you know, we really love this scene. There was something really quite beautiful about it. So I think that um, it's a wake-up call for her, too, as to the people that she's with. Right. And I think she's ashamed about that. Because, you know, I don't think we've seen her ashamed in any regard. But I think she's actually now starting to just, oh, my God. Why did you help me? He told you he was going to let you go home. He told me the same thing. We're going to make sure he keeps his word. And how are we going to do that? Together. If you could have opted for any mark, would you? what would you have opted for? I think that's a pretty good one. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to get branded, I mean, why not be called a traitor <laughs> and, and, and a killer? No, I, I think that it's probably accurate um, for her way of thinking. I mean... She expresses remorse to Jack about um, the killing, so we have to take her at her word that that's how she feels. She did it in a cold way, but I have to think she just did, you know, that's how she does things. I do think she's fairly lethal, but I don't necessarily think that she feels good about it. So we'll have to see. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. You always find out, you know, kind of so far, but from what I've been... I mean, I think she usually tells the truth, Juliet. That's my my thought for her. Of course, Juliet isn't the only character on the island who can be lethal. As we learned last week, Nikki and Paolo have a bit of a dark side. To learn more about their exploits, we now turn it over to executive producer Carlton Cuse and fellow writers Eddie Kitsis and Adam Horowitz. Hi guys, Carlton here, and Damon. Uh, the role of Damon will be played by his understudies. Uh, this is Eddie Kitsis, and this is Adam Horowitz. Yes, Damon is not here today. He is uh, he is busy doing other things today, including uh, working on the finale episode. So I'm here with guest writer producers. Edward Kitsis and Adam Horowitz. Hello. Hey. And those of you who are fans of the show have probably seen their names on many of the better episodes of Lost. Well, thank and you. so we invited them in here to, uh, to join us uh, to talk about Expose, an episode which, by coincidence, they happen to write. Uh, Eddie and Adam have worked on the show since uh, sort of in the middle of the first season. They, uh, they have worked on a lot of what are called locker shows. Um, which are basically shows where, you know, kids are in a hallway with lockers and worked on basically every WB show that was on the air, pretty, pretty much, right? Pretty much, yeah. We, we did our time there. Yeah. And um, I actually met them on a very short-lived show that most people would actually defy had actually been aired called uh, Black Sash that was on the WB for a brief moment in time opposite the uh, commencement of the Iraq War. Yeah, and um, Eddie and Adam had been working on another um, Warner Brothers show called Birds of Prey and came over to actually lend a hand on Black Sash. And I love them dearly, recognized immediately their immense talents as writers. And when I got involved in Lost and was looking to hire to some new writers, I immediately thought of Eddie and Adam. However, at that time, they were tied up on an excellent show called Life as We Know It, also on ABC. And it took a long time to extract them from the from the uh, grip of that show, right? Yeah, that is true. We basically owe everything to Carlton, pretty much. Yeah, not really, but it's nice of you to say. Will I get to see my children anytime soon? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're held hostage. <laughs> Please understand that all these all questions are being answered yeah. under uh, under threat of hostages. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I want to, you know, we thought we'd start by talking a little bit. Let's rehash Expose. How Excellent. about that? That would be awesome. So, uh, so Eddie, talk about the twist of having Nikki and Paolo be essentially bad people. 
I mean, how difficult was it to plot out their story? And how many of those details were planted several episodes ago, like the flushing of the toilet in the Pearl Station? Let's start with the flushing of the toilet. Uh, well, I would say, you know, really, season one was when we all discussed uh, Apollo and Nikki during minicamp, the idea of an a- a- actress uh, that would be on the show. That came up, that idea came up, yeah, at, toward the end, of, at the very end of season one. Yeah, and then we just thought, when was the right time to put them in? And and I think this year we we realized was uh, we'd introduce Paolo and Nikki. And as far as the the toilet thing, um, what better way to introduce a character than yeah. the toilet flush? That's that's true. That's there's not much. There's, that you there's can a do way to announce that. a presence. Yeah, yes. I mean, you immediately recognized uh, Paolo. You know, part of our idea was to actually, you know, a lot of people have been asking us, well, what about the Sox, which is what we call the background players? Mm-hmm. I mean, they all, here they are, they're in the show every week, and like, you know, we had actually brought Dr. Arts out of the chorus, but we really hadn't, and, you know, certainly minor characters like Steve and Scott, but we hadn't really spent any time with them, and people had always thought, well, there's a great source of characters in New Character Conflict, and over time on the show, we would actually meet some of these other characters, and so... We um, we decided we would do that with Nikki and Paolo, and how did that work out? I think it worked out well. I guess it's going to depend on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't seem like the fans liked it too much. Well, I, I think the fans kept asking, "What about the socks?" And so we gave them the socks, and, and then they didn't like. And that. then they said, "What about everyone else?" So, who the hell are Nikki and Paolo? Is pretty much and why? Yeah, are we who the hell are Nikki and Paolo? But I think that you know, regardless of of maybe the lot of setup we did this year, I think the payoff for Nikki and Paolo was worth introducing them no matter what. I mean, this, this is one of our... I would say that this was one of the, uh, our favorite episodes that we've done this year, and, and the ending to us is... I mean, anytime you get to bury someone alive... Yeah, well, that's good television. That's good television. You can't. You oh, I can't was talking about that. television. Yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. But that was good, too. Yeah. That was I mean, good, too. Yeah, exactly. He to was, be fair, the idea of uh, burying them alive was, of course, Damon, who uh, can be darker than us, I suppose. <laughs> he has his dark moments. But, you know, for us, what was awesome about this episode was getting to go back and see Arts again. Yes. And all these great, iconic moments from season one and season two. And kind of seeing them through the perspective of, of somebody you, you didn't realize was there. Yeah, you know, and... and... Writing for Boone and Shannon again was a lot of fun, and you know it was just it was a really cool way to revisit all this stuff. But it sort of felt like, you know, it needed that ending. It needed that you know that sort of reason for going through this journey. And uh, and there was no other way for them to to learn. I think their lesson. Well, yeah, we'd always been you know we'd always had talked about basically um, how we wanted to introduce Nikki as an actress and basically play a scene from her show and then sort of flip that revelation into, oh my gosh, we thought we, we were thinking we're seeing one kind of a story, but then we realize that it's actually just a show that she's acting in. And it ended up being just one scene in their flashback story, but I think it was a very effective way to establish her character. And, you know, really from very early on in the show, we'd always wanted to have this sort of actress who'd been like in Australia working on a syndicated mm-hmm. show and then Paula was her boyfriend. And, you know, it, it was... Uh, but it, you know, it just didn't. It turned out we sort of were in the situation where, when we started the season, we had we were as always very ambitious, and it's a little bit like going to the supermarket when you're really hungry and you buy like four things for dinner, and you come yeah. home and you have one or or two. Well, maybe you have three, but maybe three, but, but one definitely is going to sit in and, the fridge for three months, and yeah. then you realize. And, and they were the ones sitting in the fridge. I mean, yeah. after we'd done all those episodes of the others out there in uh, the cages and. You know, by the time we finally got back to our beach, people was like, "Do we really have time for Nikki and Paolo?" And the answer was, "No." Well, but we, we had didn't a have time, time to bury them alive. We did not. It's it's funny because I remember very early on when we talked about it with you guys, and uh, the original idea had been to do an entire episode that was just ex- expose, expose the show, and yeah. that the twist at the end would be right. what is the end of the teaser, which is, "Oh my God, Nikki is on a show." And that that cool idea stayed with us throughout the entire season until we finally got to this episode and found the way to to work it into the story. But um, I think if 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 we could 
do what we wanted to, we might have done a lot of expose episodes. Well, listen, we're not. It's not just that that the three of us are big fans of expose. You know, Hurley's a big fan, and John Locke's a big fan. Yeah. I, if, if any of you've got any, uh, there was yeah, there was of, a secret. Cr- there was a cross there for those yeah. of you who might have missed it. If you still John have. Locke and his backstory before um, the kid arrived, he was in uh, expose. Hi, I'm really really sorry to interrupt, but um, Dana wants to know if. Vincent can have magic powers, and if it's okay, if he dies in the finale. That's uh, Christine, cannot, Christina Kim. Christina uh, Kim, ladies and gentlemen. One of our other writers. Come on in, Christina. I'm really sorry to interrupt. We just wanted to um, answer. For okay. Oh. Vincent can have magic powers. But not but in he, the finale. But not in the finale. He cannot die, but he can fly. He can talk, too. And so, it should be from magic but dharma. But flying, talking, okay. But, wait, when yeah. he's, but yeah. not dead. No, when he no. talks, it's through his paws. Can he talk in Korean? No, but he can talk in Hebrew. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sorry Christina Kim. Sorry. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, so Adam, tell me about Billy D. Williams. Billy D. Williams. What can we say about Billy D. Williams other than it was probably the fulfillment of a lifelong dream to cast him? The part was conceived, written, and owned by Billy D. Williams. Well, for and then owned by him. Yeah. We, Adam uh, wanted him so badly that Carlton and Damon. Yeah, here's the thing. My, my history with Billy D. Williams goes back a long way, much further than he realizes, which is, um, well, one, seeing The Empire Strikes Back when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And then years, years later, on one of those WB shows that Carlton was talking about, uh, a show called Popular, which Eddie and I worked on for a few years, we had wanted to cast him in a part, and uh, it ultimately didn't work out. The part didn't happen, but. They sent his headshot, and the headshot we got was Billy D in Empire holding his blaster. blaster. And uh, still hangs on it your hangs office. on my office walls, proudly, proudly inspiring me, keeping me going through everything. And when this episode came forward, we knew who Mister Lashad would be played by. There was and no and it was it was all the more you know rewarding because Jimmy Kimmel had done these fantastic little lost parodies yeah. on his show featuring Billy Dee Williams cut into existing lost scenes. But what was great about Billy Dee is, is that we wanted him so badly that Carlton and Damon came into our office and had these looks on their faces like somebody just died, and they go, "Guys, we need to see you in your off our office." So we it was DefCon One. We uh, we were like something really 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 bad happened and we're being pulled in alone and they closed the door and they looked at us and they said Billy D passed so immediately was, they were crushed I could not I mean it was like was, unbelievable it was like somebody it was like saying there's no Christmas or, or, or even Hanukkah <laughs> and then finally by the time they told us they were kidding we were so shell shocked that we didn't it wasn't believe even, it it wasn't even funny yeah oh let's prehash a little bit about Left Behind you guys looking forward to seeing that next week? I'm absolutely mm. uh, looking forward to seeing uh, Kate and Juliet uh, uh, together. Yes, handcuffed together. Handcuffed yes. together? Are you oh. kidding? Come on, they got to be showing that in the preview. Yeah. They have to be. I mean, if they're not, then I don't know what they're and, showing. And if they're not hinting that there's a there's a monster, then that's not good either. That's not good either. The monster, the monster's back. Are you happy about that? It's, it's been like, so long since we got to write McGraw on a page. <laughs> Really, I mean, he's, it's like an old friend coming to visit. It's like you just pick up right where you left off. It doesn't yes. matter if it's been eight episodes or 20. That's true. That's very true. All right, should we get to some questions, Chris? All right. This is, uh, this is a good one for you guys. It's called, uh, it's under the title, How Long Does It Take You to Film? Posted by Adu, A-E-U-D-I-E-W. Hello, Masters of Lost. And I think by that, by Masters of Lost, they clearly mean Eddie and Adam. Wow. How long does it take you to film one episode of Lost? Well, uh, usually about eight days. Uh, like Hanukkah? Eight, day, eight, days, eight days first I'm unit. Dying here. And, and two days second unit. So like ten actual filming days. Right. But, but it takes us a couple of weeks to break and write a story, and then it takes at least a couple of weeks to post Mm-hmm. The episode, so and it's, ultimately and it's about a five-week process to make an episode, which is amazing because we, you know, we do in five weeks what movies do in five months, and so it's amazing that or five we, years, yeah, five years even. I mean, you know, so we may film eight pages a day or six pages a day, and a movie does like a half a page. Carlton, yes, this question is from Aziza, nineteen sixty-nine. Damon and Carlton. In two of Hurley's flashbacks, there's reference to a man jumping off the roof of his financial advisor's building. We actually see the man falling through a window in the episode numbers. 
Hurley mentions a man and Trisha Tanaka is dead. It would seem right up your alley to have this be one of your Cross's Easter eggs, but Locke was paralyzed for four years before Flight 815. And I am not sure Hurley had won lo the lottery four years previous to Flight 815. Can you confirm or deny that the falling man is Locke? I can confirm that the falling man was not Locke. Uh, that, that has, uh, there's a lot of speculation about that, but um, while a good idea for a cross, the timeline does not work out, and so indeed it was yet another uh, unfortunate soul falling. Um, you know, I think there's sort of our two things we do a lot of on the show. One is father issues, and the other is people falling from buildings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, guys, this is from Blue Bagel Bear. Mm. Where is everyone? I know there's a lot of people on the show, but some of them we never see. We do not even see some of them walking around on the beach in the background. That's not one word, that's two words. Background. Like Rose and her husband, Bernard. Are they not shown in every episode because of time or money? Or is this supposed to be a clue, like they are not on the island at the same time? It seems like you would at least have them in the background. Well, Rose and Bernard... Um, <laughs> Absolutely, you have to think of the island as everyone's having a life, like, you know, no different than anywhere else. And, yeah, we may be focusing on uh, Jack or Hurley at the time. And at that time, Rose and Bernard may be having a picnic down the beach. They may be eating. But I will say this. At the country this, club? Yeah, at the country club. Playing bridge? Yeah. But if I were a fan, I would be disappointed if I didn't see them this year. So We will be, we seeing, are, we Rose. Will be seeing Rose and Bernard again. And they have, I, what I like to say is a, a, uh, they have a really awesome storyline coming up that I think people will be really excited. Uh, they're not just coming on to be background. They're coming on to be, you know, players. But the, but the truth is we really wouldn't want to subject Rose and Bernard to just be standing around in the background in an episode. And, mm -hmm. and um, while they are not regular actors on the show, they are recurring actors on the show. So... You know, when we have them on the show, we want to have them on the show with something to do. And uh, we feel like we have a good storyline coming up for them. And we are actually very happy to have them back. And, and yeah. it is it has been too long. So. Uh, Carlton, this is actually a perfect one for you. Uh, how do you come up with the names? By Steadicam Jr. Wow. He's had one post in the last 90 days. I'd like to ask Steadicam Jr. how he come, came up with his name. Let's start there. Ooh. How do you come up with the names for new characters? Do you try and link the names to something about the character, base them on friends' names, or just use something like fake, fakenamegenerator.com? Fakenamegenerator.com. <laughs> That's the greatest thing ever. I can tell you we will start using fakenamegenerator.com. Is that like how you get like your, you know, porn name or something? Yes. You on... <laughs> it's your dog's name and your street name that you grew up on? Yeah. Well, okay. No, we, uh, we don't do that. We, um, we actually, some names are basically just generic. Other names are very well chosen. Clearly, you know, certain characters are named after philosophers and those philosophers, you know, usually there's something in the work of those people that has, that is a clue or some sense of, um, of who that character is or something about who they are. So we try to create a little bit of linkage between, you know, maybe a, a, a character's sort of philosophical antecedent and, and their, their kind of current role on the show. Um, other times, characters are just sort of randomly named. And the truth is, you know, it's funny, someone had actually joked about there are certain similarities between Lost and Heroes. And there, there's a whole clearance thing that happens, which is very interesting. That you know, the there's a legal department which has to make sure that you know we're not accidentally, you know, uh, or intentionally disparaging someone in the choice of names. And so there's certain criteria by which you can use a, a person's name. If it's, you know, if there's a lot of people with the same name, you can use it because it couldn't be mistaken as a single person's name. If there's only like one person with that name, then we usually have to change the name. So oftentimes the names are selected by virtue of. You know, what will actually clear? And does fakenamegenerator.com clear? I don't know, but uh, we're going there immediately. We are. That is podcast. absolutely, you just saved Lost, um, Steady Cam Jr. Okay, so uh, let me ask you guys another question here. All right, so this is from Maxinova, 14 posts in the last 40 days, Thanksgiving and Christmas on the island. So I can't help but notice that the Lost Aways completely blew off Thanksgiving last year. <laughs> It would have happened at the end of season two, so they were rather busy getting captured and blowing up the hatch, so I can kind of understand. But are they going to celebrate Christmas? Only a few more days and island time to go. Unfortunately, our island's biggest Christian, Echo, is a little too dead to make a nativity scene. 
Well, you know what? It's You're talking be... about t- two big Hanukkah supporters, right? Yeah, right. I, you know what? You're going to have to, you know, like all holidays, it's timing. And the thing on the show is, I'm sure everyone would love to have Christmas. It's Aaron. It would be Aaron's first Christmas. Um, it would be a nice way to get together. But, you know, you never know. No, I mean, on Crazy Island, what's going to happen to to ruin Christmas? The Grinch could be the others. Yeah. I would say it's likely that Christmas will happen in year four yeah, of the show. I, I would I mean, say it ain't going to happen in the finale. Yeah. I mean, again, because they will be rather busy getting captured and blowing up um, things like the hatch. You know, pretty much every finale has people oh, getting yeah. captured and blowing something up. I would say that Santa Claus, by the way, right now is one of their rescue options. So. We're gonna. That's at this that's point awesome. the best option there, they have. Yeah. There, there's are two options. I think one option is Santa Claus arrives, and yeah. that's the rescue option. Secondly, they wait until someone builds a Starbucks on the island. Oh, that's good. Well, you know, you know what it would be is 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 Santa would land his sled would uh, be broken, and Saeed and Jack would have to trek to find a part to fix the sled to get them off and, the island. But Santa gets injured. Yeah. Hurley there has you to go. Don, Hurley has to don the suit. Yeah. That's and, a lost episode. And pretend to, and actually take over for Santa Claus on his, you know, entire nights of trek while Santa Claus is actually surgically repaired by Jack, although yeah. Jack will have to cut his foot off with the giant luggage cart. Oh my god, and a flashback to Santa? This oh is my great. God. This is 401. Yeah. Santa Santa's flashback. Yeah. Santa's got a limp. That's oh, this good. Is phenomenal. <laughs> All right. Carlton, would you like another question? I would like one last question and then we're out of here so fast. We're going to run. We're Which running one? for Did fake I, name. I oh, you got it. I can't resist Adam and I are fighting over, but I think this one's going to win solely uh, on the subject matter. Adam, read the, the subject. The subject line is, where are you supposed to keep your chicken? <laughs> this comes from My Name is Unique 42, 182 posts in the last 90 days. Locke says to Ben something like, if you really understood the island, you wouldn't need to keep the chicken in the refrigerator. The more I think about this, the more confused what? I get. <laughs> I, I'm let's, assuming, let's just say I'm confused right I'm here. I'm assuming that my name is Unique 42 is paraphrasing. There's four things that this guy is. Okay. Um, my name is Unique is. Uh, is what is it? What? Go ahead. Get to his confused issues. about. One, the leftover. Leftover is, chicken. Is Locke suggesting leftovers won't go bad if left outside the refrigerator? No. Two, the leftovers don't need to be saved as the island will provide you with food when you need it. Is that what he's suggesting? No. Three. Is he suggesting the chicken is not island kosher and it shouldn't be eaten or perhaps even and then the, just trails off? Do you guys, what do you guys think about that? Chicken is not island kosher for sure. Okay. And lastly, is Locke suggesting that Ben isn't healing fast enough because he is eating refrigerated food? Yes. Right. That one is actually kind of true. I mean, I think that Locke is unhappy that, that Ben is using too many sort of technological resources and that he's losing perhaps his sense of being in tune with the island and I think that's thematically something which will become very important in future episodes. Wouldn't, would that be fair to say? I think that is absolutely true, Carlton. And this is not the last you'll see of Chicken. Or John Locke or Ben. Or uh, what about Cooper in that box? Are we going to so-called box? Yeah. Metaphoric so, box. Yes. The metaphoric so-called box. Are we, yeah. getting, are we getting back to that? I mean, how much longer are we going to have to wait? Okay. I'd say probably, wait, wait, wait. That would be beginning of May. Yeah, Four weeks, yeah, 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 pretty long. Well, well, not even that. No, it's end of April or something. End of April. So a little yeah. after Arbor Day. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Well, they will be, be celebrating end. Arbor Day. And actually, Tax Day, too. Yeah. That's also a big holiday on the island. Can you imagine what a holiday is when you don't have to file income taxes? I mean, actually, actually that's rescue option three. The IRS comes yeah, looking they, for them they because they don't taxes. file They're tax. the only people well, who have tax early. problems. That, yeah. that, that's, okay, the ending of the show, it's been revealed here on this podcast. The IRS finds Hurley for back taxes owed on his 156, is it 156 million now? It's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of money. money, but it's the IRS versus Santa. Yeah, well, guys, this has really been enjoyable. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Um, Dan and I will be back next week to talk about Left Behind, Ooh. and we'll be prehashing uh, the next episode of the show. Uh, and I'd like to thank Carlton for, for letting uh, Adam and I come in here and for bringing us to Lost. I mean, this has been amazing. So thank you, Carlton. Yes, thank you, Carlton. All right, boys. Peace out. Thank you. Bye. That brings us to the end of this week's podcast. Join us next time for more commentary and insight, including a humorous story from Josh Holloway about an adventure Daniel Day Kim and him had on a boat in the middle of a storm which parallel their fictional lives just a little bit too much. Left Behind airs Wednesday, April 4th, from 10 to 11 p.m. on ABC, and the next day at abc.com.
This is for Mac McKinney. Mac, your chance has passed to play professional ball, but you can live vicariously through Vince Young's rookie year. You've obviously seen how he plays. Now see how he lives with AT&T Home Turf. Just go online to attblueroom.com slash sports for exclusive access into your favorite athlete's worlds. See inside Vince's home and check out the AT&T technology that keeps him connected. So that's Mac's world. For everyone who's not Mac, if we can deliver his favorite quarterback to him, we've got what it takes to deliver your favorite athletes to you. The new AT&T. Your world delivered.